But I wonder at the moment whether you've been affected by what's been going on with COVID. I find there are a lot of things that Satan is using to try and divide the church and divide his people. I think there's a lot of things that he's using to divide the, uh, not just the, the people of, of the church, but families are being divisive. And uh, we need to be careful of that because the word of God says that we are to try and maintain and endeavor to keep the unity of the faith. Mum was saying someone was being nasty. We need to be careful when we're looking at preference rather than doctrine. We need to be careful when we're looking at personality and make sure that that does not become a problem. We need, because look, let's face it, sometimes it's hard to love the unlovable. But we need to love them. God says that we need to love our enemies. Husbands are, lo are to love their wives, even as Christ loved the church. That's the way it's to be. That's the way the Bible says it to be. But be careful in this day and age and in this climate that we don't have that division among ourselves. We need to endeavor to keep the unity of the faith. There's enough division between the saved and the unsaved. Yep, I can see the ones that probably would. <laughs> it's all right. All right, but there was silence for half an hour, but this silence was an eerie expectation. And in verse two, we saw that there were seven angels. Seven angels. These seven angels were given seven trumpets. And I think that's where uh, we got up to last week. But in verse 3, and we looked at trumpets and why they were sounded in the Old Testament and uh, looking forward to the trumpet that we're going to hear when God calls us home to be with himself. Are you looking for that trumpet? I hope you are. Are you expecting that trumpet? I hope you are. Are you going to be happy when that trumpet blows? hope you will be because that trumpet that sounds will call all christians home to be with jesus all those that have put their faith and trust in him will be ever present with the lord what a blessing verse three we see another angel 
And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, some people say that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared as the angel of the Lord pre-incarnate. He appeared before Joshua as the uh, captain of the host of the Lord. He appeared before Abraham in the wilderness. He appeared many times to different ones, appeared before Jacob, wrestled with Jacob. In the Old Testament, he appeared. And we know that in the New Testament that he is the great high priest. And this seems to be a mediatory priestly role that this angel is performing because he has the incense and he's offering up the prayers of the saints with the smoke. But in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ does not have an angelic body. He has a physical body, albeit when he has uh, been resurrected and gone to, be, gone to heaven, he has a glorified body, not an angelic body. Some of the, um, some of the uh, commentaries say that uh, this is a symbolic role. Uh, uh, that Jesus Christ is the great high priest, but this angel is symbolic of offering up as a priest uh, these prayers. But regardless of that, we need to realize that Jesus Christ is the one and only mediator between God and man. We're told that in the scriptures. First Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6, it says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due times. This is Jesus Christ. So regardless of who this is, we need to focus on the fact of who Jesus is and that he is our mediator. We don't need another priest on earth to mediate between us and God. We have Jesus Christ. We don't need Mary or we don't need the saints, so-called, to mediate between us and, and God. Jesus Christ is that one mediator. Amen. He makes intercession for us. He is our saviour. He gave himself a ransom for all. And here's our mediator. But whether this is Christ or whether this is some other angel, an angel of the same kind, a lot of commentaries say, regardless of that, we see that this relates back to the Old Testament where the, um, where the priest would take coals from off of the brazen altar in the courtyard that i talked about today and then where they did the sacrifices and he would put that into a censer and he would put incense on that a special incense that was uh the the uh recipe was given by god and they would then take that within the veil leviticus chapter 16 and verses 12 and 13 says and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not this was a covering cloud if you like so you would have a golden censer, just like it's described here in verse 3. This other angel stood at the altar having a golden censer. So we see two things. And we see this in Leviticus. Took the censer, put the coals, had special tongs. 
golden tongs to take the coals off the fire, off the altar, and put that in the censer and then carry it into the holy place, the tent, the tabernacle. And then he would then put those onto the altar of incense and then put the incense on and the smoke. Now, think about this. This is fine incense. And so when it gets on there, it's going to basically compact and it's going to send up a lot of smoke. But it's going to be a smoke of a sweet scent that he's offering before the Lord. And so he, he does that. And this smoke goes up before the mercy seat in the Old Testament and up before God here in this passage of Scripture. Same sort of thing. Verse 4, we see the smoke and the saints' prayers. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. We'll get that, get to that in a minute. But I want to talk about here the prayers of the saints. I believe the tribulation saints. I believe the saints of this day and age also offered up before the Lord. Now, I just want you to know this, that I'm not talking about saints like the Catholics or other religions might see saints. I'm talking about every believer that comes to know Jesus Christ. Every child of God is a saint before the Lord. Only God can make us pure. Only Jesus Christ can cleanse us from our sins. All believers are saints. You don't have to have some special act. You don't have to be dead. And we can't pray through saints. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that people that are dead can pray for us and on our behalf in heaven. We are all saints. Let's look at a few verses and see if the scriptures back up what I say. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is in Corinth with all the saints that are in Achaia. That sounds like a lot of saints, doesn't it? That's because it is. Because it's talking about all the saved people in Archive. Not just a few. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the, of the grace of God bestow on the churches of Macedonia how that in great... Uh, I'm in chapter 8, so if you're following me there, that will be no good. We're in chapter 9, that's where we need to be. It says, it was a nice verse anyway, it's good to read scripture. So chapter 9, verse 1, sorry about that, folks. For as touching the ministering of the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia, and uh, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. What's that talking about? It's talking about ministering to the Christians that were in need. And that's what they were doing, ministering to the saints, ministering to save people that were in need. Uh, and in chapter 9 and verse 12, it says, For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. The saints, the believers, not just a handful, 13, 13 of the same book. <clears throat> Verse 12 is not very COVID safe. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, we can't even shake hands, but that's okay. 
But it says in verse 13, all the saints salute you. All the believers that were with Paul salute you. If we look in Philippians over a few books, Philippians chapter 4. Twenty-one and twenty-two. It says, "Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are of Caesar's household." I hope I've been to enough scriptures to convince you that we don't have to pray through saints. That every believer is a saint. We can pray for one another here on earth. Amen. We can pray with one another. And that's what we should be doing. I want to encourage you. But we can pray directly to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. He is the one that has opened the way. He is the one who has made the way open for us. And our prayers, when we do pray here on this earth, are enhanced by God. Did you know that? Who supplied the incense that this angel had? God did. All things come from God. Every good gift, we're told in James. So we see that this incense was supplied by God, by God and made it smell so much better and it feels so much better to God. We need to be praying to God. But what should our prayer be? We are told in 1 John that we should pray along with the will of God, according to the will of God. That if anything is according to the will of God, then he will hear us. And our prayers are important to God. Does that mean we can change things that happen by prayer? Can we, through God, beg for him to change circumstances? I believe so. Even though God is sovereign and God has got everything mapped out and what God says will happen, will happen. Amen? Yeah. If God says that Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds, is Jesus Christ going to come in the clouds? He is. Amen? If God says that we can pray to him for the sick, can we pray for the sick? Yeah, we can. Does it mean that um, God will answer the way we want to answer sometimes? But we still need to pray. And here's the reason. The reason is that we are commanded to pray. First Thessalonians 5.17, it says, Pray without ceasing. Luke 18.1, it says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. In the epistles, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be made known unto God. 1 Peter 5.7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God wants us to pray. We are commanded to pray. Jesus was an example of prayer. An interesting study for you to do and as a look at the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Study it for yourself. Because he was frequent in prayer and he was fervent in prayer. He was fervent in how he prayed. Think about when he was in the garden and he was praying to God and it was sweat as blood coming from him. It's how fervent he prayed. I don't think any of us have got to that stage. But that's how Jesus prayed. And the length of time he prayed, I'd get to about 11 o'clock and I'd be falling asleep. He prayed all night at times, all night. 
That is our Saviour, the example of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Jesus taught it. Remember when the disciples said, teach us to pray? And he taught them, say these things, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. He taught them how to pray. Interesting. One of the things that he did pray, get them to pray, thy kingdom come. Isn't his kingdom coming anyway? Yes. But he wants us to pray about it. Think about right at the end of the book of Revelation when the Lord Jesus Christ says, I come quickly. And John says, even so come Lord Jesus. Are we praying that? Should be. Even so come Lord Jesus. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are we praying that? For our own lives? For the, for the government? For the people of the land? Are we praying those things? We need to be. We need to be praying God's will will be done. Is God's will going to be done? Without our prayers? Yes. But does he want us to pray for those things? Yes, he does. And we want to realize this, that prayer is effective. If you don't believe me, put it to the test sometime in faith. Like I said, not all prayers are going to be answered the way that we want them to be answered. But they will be answered the way God wants them to be answered. To his honour and glory. But he still wants us to pray. And we need to pray. <clears throat> He is an omniscient God. He is an omnipotent God. He knows all. He knows our frailties. And he wants us to go to him. You know what? Prayer brings us to God, makes us rely on him more. That's what we need to be doing in every situation. Are we relying on him? Or are we getting anxious about things? Are we being careful about things? Are we worrying? Are we caring too much about things and not giving them over to God? Because that's what we need to be doing. And think about this, that these prayers are a sweet savour to the Lord. That puts a whole new aspect on, on our prayer life. God listens to us when we pray. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, it says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because you ask not. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. You see, Sometimes we don't get what we want because we're asking the wrong thing. We need to ask the right thing. We need to ask it as uh, believers and we need to ask it in faith. We need to ask it uh, with a pure heart. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. It goes on and talks about the fish and the serpent, etc. We need to be the fact that if we have an earthly father who will give us good things, we have a heavenly father who will give us even better things. In James chapter 5 and verse 14, when it talks about prayer, it talks about those that are sick that the elders of the church, let them pray over them, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall forgive him. 
confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of heart much. You see, we need to do these things. We need to pray and have that total reliance on God for everything. You see, we are responsible to pray to God according to his will. And I want to ask you, have we lost fervency to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, God is not willing that any should perish. That's God's will. Are we praying for souls? Are we praying for the unbelievers in our family? Are we praying for the unbelievers around us? Are we doing it enough? I think if we start praying for them earnestly, that we'll want to witness to them more. That's what happens. As we pray for people, then we want to, they're, they're on our mind more when we're praying for them. I want to encourage you for one unsaved person to pray for them fervently this week. Pray for opportunities. Think of someone right now that you could pray for. Pray for them earnestly this week. Pray for opportunities that you might be able to share the gospel. You know, you might get a little bit disappointed with their reaction, but that's okay. Our responsibility is to pray for them. Our responsibility is to witness to them. It is God's responsibility to save them. Yeah. And you know what? If you keep praying for them, it might be 40 years later and they come to know the Lord. It's happened. It's happened. God is not willing. That is the will of God that any should perish. Have we lost our thankfulness? Are we, are we really thankful to God? You know, it tells us in the word of God that giving thanks to God, being thankful to God, is his will. This is the will of God concerning you, we're told in the book of Thessalonians. I want to, well, I want to encourage you this week to think of a few things that you can be really thankful for and pray to God and thank him for those things. Regardless of the situation, be thankful for something this week. Maybe a few things. Have we lost the desire to grow and to be sanctified? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 3, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. The will of God that we should be sanctified. It goes on, talks about a lot of other things, but we need to realize that we need to desire to grow in the Lord, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you pray to God that you will grow in the Lord? I know I've been slack in this area a lot, and we need to pray because when we're praying about something, our focus will be on that. Our desire will be towards that. Are you watching? Are you watching for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? I tell you what, in this day and age, if we're not, you know, we've got our ears turned off and our eyes closed because the signs are there. But you know what? If we're praying about Jesus is coming, even so, come Lord Jesus, like I quoted in the book of Revelation, then we are going to be focused on that. We are going to be watching for that. This is the will of God, that we are watching for his coming. Some of the commentators that I, I was reading were saying that God wants us to pray. Think about, about the coming kingdom, about his coming again. He's, you know, thy kingdom come in the, in the Lord's prayer. If we're praying about it, will it hurry it along? I don't know, but definitely God wants us to pray about his kingdom and his coming kingdom. 
and desire it for coming to come in. It is important that we pray. It is essential that we pray. It's like a breath that we take as a believer. It's getting the oxygen into our lungs when we're praying. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be praying. If you want to live as a believer, you need to be praying. You need to be breathing. God desires us to pray. Last point, and I'm going to do this quickly, is in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 8. And I've looked at the clock, and it says 11 o'clock, so I've only just started the service, so that's okay. Like I was saying today, what does it mean when the pastor puts his watch up there? Nothing. <clears throat> Is that right, Lottie? Yeah. All right. Okay. Verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast to the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. Silence was broken. Remember, up until this time, there was silence in heaven. The angel takes the censer and puts some more fire in it and then throws it, hurdles it towards the earth. And then there were loud voices. Are you ready for it? Loud voices after silence would be a bit scary, I think, don't you? And this fire that comes hurtling towards the earth is the sign of dramatic, dramatic, uh, drastic change, dramatic change is going to come upon the earth. God's wrath is going to be poured out of the earth. And fire, remember, portrays the judgment of God. And all those who have rejected the saving grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ that have remained upon the earth must face this time of wrath. Hebrews 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation that shall devour the adversaries. If you're here this morning, or if you're listening on the video this morning, if you have rejected Jesus Christ as your saviour, then you only have a fearful looking for the judgment and fire indignation of God. People don't like to hear that. But the wrath of God will abide upon you if you do not trust in Jesus Christ as your saviour. If you're scared, good. Because it will be nothing but scary. If you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your saviour, you won't Face him as your saviour or face him as your judge. And the most fearful words that you'll ever hear would be, depart from me for I never knew you. We were talking about division and COVID earlier. This is the greatest division. The saved and the unsaved. Those that have trusted in what Jesus Christ did on the cross to save them from their sins and those that have not. Whether it be, I don't care, I don't want to do anything about it, or whether they've openly rejected Jesus Christ as their saviour, they are going to face the wrath of God. And not just for a short time. The word of God tells us that it is for eternity. Because they have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done desp uh, despite under the Spirit of grace. They haven't listened. And this silence to violence, when this bowl, uh, this censer is thrown down to the earth, the voices, the loud foreboding, voice of God not the still quiet voice 
the thunderings and the lightnings, the fearful natural power of God, the earthquake, the violent shaking of the earth. Now, we've had a little one in Australia. We were down in Mawala when, we, uh, when that earthquake took place. We were pretty close. Not that close. Vanilla would have been even closer. But things were falling off shelves. And it was only a little earthquake. Imagine what a big earthquake is going to be like. You can feel the earth moving. You can feel the building moving. You can see things moving. But these earthquakes that are going to take place in the last times of the book of Revelation are going to be massive. There's going to be no mistake. God's wrath poured out upon the earth. What a blessing. As believers, we won't be here for that. Amen. Amen. We'll be in glory. Well, I want you to encourage you to pray this week. As I said, pray for somebody who's not saved. Pray that the will of God be done in your life and that you be sanctified and that you'll grow in the Lord. Pray that Jesus Christ will come and come soon and that you'll be found watching and waiting for him. Pray also for those that will be going through the tribulation that they might turn to Christ when God pours out his wrath upon them, that they would not openly shake their fist at God because some will, some even today are doing the same thing. I hope that's not you. I hope that you have trusted in Jesus as your Savior. Let us pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your loving kindness. We thank you and praise you for uh, the blessing of salvation in Jesus Christ and everything that brings, that we can approach the throne of God openly in prayer for all things. Help us, Lord, to pray according to your will. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be thankful. Lord, we pray that you would help us. Lord, to be a blessing to others to have a fervor in witnessing by praying for certain ones. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be praying about your coming kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.